Started by Crytek, continued by Ubisoft, the Far Cry series is known by the broad gaming public as the series of shooters where you can run over sheep, then skin them, where the fire looks great, and where once giving you malaria was an in-game mechanic as if that would ever be a good idea. So I think it's fair to do a history of the series start to finish, with only a couple of gaps because I couldn't get things working. What more could you hope for? Well, a three hour analysis like Noah Cold or Gervais is probably, but he's already done that so you'll have to do with my quicker look instead. Before we dive in, I'd just like to point out two things that YouTube has told me to do at the start of my videos to make them better or something. First, I have a Patreon and you can support my efforts to change the face of the videos I make by supporting me there. Second, you should subscribe because that would be great for me and probably good for you too. Who knows? Anyway, Far Cry. 14 years, a couple of bar raises, a lot of hype and some personal opinions. It's all here in a list which begins right about now. Far Cry let you play how you wanted. That was a huge thing in 2004. Not a new thing, sure, GTA was riding high, Morrowind existed, other games you'll all whine that I should have mentioned in the comments happened too, but Far Cry was a first person shooter that let you play how you wanted. It was big, it was pretty, it was from a major publisher, and an unknown dev. You could run, creep, swim, drive boat, boat as a verb, shoot slash, shoot more, be spotted, shoot some more, and die a lot. It introduced me personally to the joy of using binoculars to spy on naughty people from afar. I can't say it was the first to do these things, but it was the most high profile to bring them all together. The most impressive, technically, and the one that had the biggest impact. Far Cry also ended up being the only one in the series to be made by its creators at Crytek, and it shows. It's undoubtedly gorgeous, alright, not by super futuristic god that statement will age in 10 years time, 2018 standards, but it was in 2004 and it holds up pretty bloody well. It was also a fun sandbox to muck about in. Other than that, yeah, not much. It's the Crytek way. It can look pretty or offer some small fun in its open approach nature, maybe even both, but it can never do anything else. Looking back, it's easy to write off Far Cry, sort of how I just did a second ago. It's clunky, it's hugely unfair at times, the story is laughable and doesn't feel like it's trying to be. Stealth is nigh on impossible, but nobody in the right mind can actually stick with that write-off because Far Cry had a real impact on the world of first-person shooters. It reset things. In the same year we got the best narrative FPS ever, Half-Life 2, that's a fact, don't argue with me, we got one of the first truly open, emergent shooters. Both raised the bar, and really I have to remember I'm here to talk about Far Cry for now because it's always tempting to chat about Half-Life 2 for 33 hours. Yeah. Crytek might not be a personal favourite of mine, I find it bizarre they're rated so much as a studio even though their output has been little more than glorified tech demos with no real meaty game bit inside. But Far Cry was important, it was genuinely impressive, everybody remembers those tropical islands. And it came at exactly the right time even if it did have those god-awful mutants in it. I'm magically including Far Cry Instincts and Evolution in this by talking about the 360 compilation released in 2006, aren't I clever? You can throw Far Cry Vengeance onto the pile too as it's only a remake of Evolution, though admittedly the only reason it isn't getting its own section is because I couldn't get it working on my console, because life is a constant struggle against failing technology. So what were the Instincts games? They were pared back versions of the original, made to suit the Xbox One one, which couldn't handle anything like OG Far Cry, and the 360, which also couldn't handle Far Cry. Hmm. At least not until 2014 when Far Cry Classic came out, though even that was still cut back from the original a decade after its original release, but I digress. The Instincts, I would say, worked as a prologue for what the series would become. The real beginning of what Far Cry is today wasn't till later. But this experiment in making a more focused but still open console-based game pushed the series in a very definite direction. While not particularly standout and special, the console games were generally a lot of fun. Stalking through the thick foil... folly trees, even if stealth is hamstrung by some classic examples of one guy sees you, they all see you. It proved both open and rewarding and let you muck about to a suitable degree. It also had daft powers that let you become some kind of super-powered animal man. Manimal. And yes, the mutants returned and were just as irksome as ever. But it was solid fun, certainly a more formed experience than the original. While I'm at it, I might as well mention Paradise Lost, the arcade game based on Far Cry that I also couldn't get working. It exists and it was like Aliens Extermination and that's about all I can offer you about it. 
This is where it started to get really interesting. While a bit of fun, the first game was a glorified tech demo, and Instincts took too much from other console FPSs of the day to be anything really special. But Far Cry 2? Yeah, this was Ubisoft taking complete control. In what has become increasingly rare as the years go by, Far Cry 2 actually saw the publisher taking risks with what it put out there. There are times when, and you need to whisper this part, I think of Far Cry 2 as, well, brave. It's just not what AAA games do. They exist to massage the ego of the player, to work as a cheerleader, keeping you engrossed in an ongoing lengthy exercise in appeasement. Far Cry 2 gave you malaria. Guns that frequently broke were set in a dirty, corrupt state in which you were no hero, and made you actually look at a map while driving in order to navigate. Call of Duty it was not. And so much about Far Cry 2 was downright stupid, enemy riddle checkpoints that respawned with a full quota of bad buggers the moment you turned your back, hostile jeeps that would chase you forever, fast travel that avoided population centres, stealth that still didn't work very well. And the bugs, which, at least on release, definitely stopped me from progressing because there wasn't a bloke where there was supposed to be a bloke. And they were all blokes because this was definitely a game in Ubisoft's era of women being too difficult to animate. And yet, the open world was gorgeous, both hostile and inviting at the same time, with weather systems, a day-night cycle, wild animals pottering about, conjuring the feeling that you really were there in an unnamed African nation. You set a fire and it caught, you made a friend and he operated as a friend. You got a disease and it... diseased. But it wasn't great. This game breaks my brain, to be honest. What's such a letdown about Far Cry 2 and paradoxically what makes me like it more as the years go by is that it's a game that doesn't care about being fun particularly. It's a set of systems in a world and you just exist in it, getting smacked about consistently for having the temerity to try and get some enjoyment from it. What first annoyed me to the point of angry shouting, that being using malaria as a game mechanic, now amuses me and frankly has me thinking it was a pretty good way of flipping the superpowered main character paradigm on its head. I could never argue Far Cry 2 was a good game, there are plenty who say it's the best in the series, even though there's only one position of contrarian and chief up for grabs. But it's full of ideas, good and bad, and it's utterly unapologetic in how it's presented, how it's approached, and how it treats the player. Well, less treats the player, more actively hates the player. I think it's safe to say that while the series followed an upward trajectory from a quality and fun standpoint after Far Cry 2, it actually started slowly circling the drain with regards to originality and creativity. The second game was far too precious to live in this world, and far too much of a swine to enjoy a comfortable retirement in our rose-tinted memories. And then, the double-edged delight that was Far Cry 3 came out and everything changed. Well developed. Everything developed. And then after it had developed, it sort of stopped developing. Like I said, double-edged. What I mean is, the game was brilliant and perfected what the series had been edging towards for years by this point. On the other edge, it edged the series in the direction that removed much of its edgy nature and edged it into the realms of Me Too Samesies territory. Edge. Honestly, I always intend to write this script to be witty and concise, but it does get away from me. So Far Cry 3, what a game. Where the second did nothing but punch the player in the face repeatedly, all while threatening to kill them with a mosquito-borne disease, the third veered back with gusto to a trope-filled, typical hero fantasy. You are Whitey McBro who goes on holiday with people you actively want to die during the first few seconds of the intro, and eventually becomes the hero of a bunch of indigenous people because of course that's how it works. It was, it's safe to say, not a particularly exciting setup, and at no point were you crippled by the symptomatic flare-up from a parasitic illness. So. Less bold, I guess? Mechanically though, Far Cry 3 was revelatory. From a broad perspective, it was an open-world first-person shooter. Zoom in on that picture and you see it went so much further than that. It's hard to think of anything invented per se, but the combination of elements formed a mechanical feedback loop that worked magnificently well. You did things, you got stuff. For example, hunting sharks, which allowed you to make wallets from their skin in one of the most ostentatious displays of money holders ever invented, which then allowed you to carry more money and so buy more expensive items. Or just by doing missions in the campaign or on the side, more items would be unlocked, thus encouraging you to play through everything in order to unlock more, which you could then purchase with cash from your shark skin wallet. 
You'd go to a radio tower, figure out the movie jumpy puzzle to climb to the top of it, and would be rewarded with more locations of interest in the area. You would gain XP, which would be put towards upgrades and skills and new abilities, which you could tailor to your own playstyle, thus resulting in more XP earned through playing how you were comfortable playing. It all just tied together so perfectly and made so much sense as a game. That was such a huge departure from the I hate you mantra of Far Cry 2, and made Far Cry 3 something you didn't feel uncomfortable playing for extended periods. I mean, it had useful fast travel, which took you to places you actually wanted to go. Stealth worked really well. And with the ability to tag enemies, it actually allowed some semblance of planning and experimentation in your approach to emptying an outpost of enemies. And those outposts stayed empty when you cleared them. It was, it is superb, and influenced so many other games. Everything under the Ubisoft banner, of course, but even the likes of, I don't know, Metal Gear Solid V owe a debt of gratitude to what Far Cry 3 introduced us all to. In isolation, I'd happily put Far Cry 3 up there with the best of all the things. It's grand and assured, it was genuinely different to other games, even if it was just the next logical step for the series specifically, and it provided literal hours of fun, dozens of memorable, intense, joyful gaming moments, and at most three times when I laughed aloud, which I don't do. Far Cry 3 was special, and nothing can change that fact. And yet, we go back to the edge, because Far Cry 3 was also the point where the series' creativity stagnated, at least mechanically. A formula had been perfected and a new era had begun whether we realised it or not, one of homogenisation and one where the excitement began to drain, even if the quality, generally speaking, maintained. I guess Blood Dragon should have been the first warning that we'd entered an era of ditto em ups, but we were all too bewildered by its presentation to notice the core remaining so very similar. A spin-off worth playing for the presentation and music alone, Blood Dragon served as an ode to those 80s and 90s sci-fi films we grew up watching, if by we we mean me, the royal we. Apex, Abraxas Guardian of the Universe Scanners, even less known indie darlings that nobody's ever heard of like Aliens or The Terminator, they were all there in some way or another, even if that way is entirely in my head. It's neon and synth, dark and faux cool edgy, it's VCR scanlines and the distant future of 2007. It's sci-fi weapons and oh so slightly hardly at all tweak mechanics from the core franchise. It's also a one note joke that wears thin after about an hour or so, instead leaving you with what Blood Dragon really is, a small playing area full of outposts to liberate with a few cyber dragons to fight along the way. Good fun? Definitely. Something to ever go back to? No. A major development for the series? Definitely not, unless you count the fact it showed Ubisoft it should keep its daft little spin-offs as DLC rather than standalone packages. I don't dislike the fact that Blood Dragon exists, but the world wouldn't have been a much poorer place had it never come to pass. But Blood Dragon was a spin-off, a bit of DLC, it was never going to change things up massively, was it? No, it was going to be the proper sequel that once again shunted things forward that took on amazing new ideas and presented a world that was, once again, unlike anything else we'd seen outside of the series. Right? <laughs> no. Far Cry 4 was a prettier Far Cry 3 with a better story and a different map, pretty much. The age of stagnation was in full swing. The fourth game is so similar to the third that it's genuinely difficult to tell them apart at first glance, especially when you don't mean that literally. It's an FPS in a colourful foreign land, you can run and drive and ride and swoop through the world. There are main missions and side quests and loads of things to sink hours of your insanely valuable and limited life into. And there's an eccentric, unstable bloke monologuing at you for extended periods. You explore and unlock areas of the map by solving jumpy, climby puzzles, you earn XP and upgrade abilities as you see fit, you scope out and plan your assaults on compounds, you hunt to make better things like a rhino skin wallet. What is wrong with these people? It's the same game. And good fun as it was, it rubbed people, like me, up the wrong way. You know the old saying, familiarity breeds Ian's brain not liking a game as much as when it's just a repeat of the last one. The old idiom from the sea. What Far Cry 4 did change up though was the setting, not just the environment, which I guess I've backed myself into a corner about and we'll have to mention shortly, but the narrative backing everything up. Ubisoft showed a genuine shunt in the direction of what we call learning, abandoning poor Johnny Football Hero and his impossibly beautiful and oh so white friends on a quest to liberate some uneducated foreigners, and instead replaced all that with a guy coming home to liberate his own nation from an invading git in a pink suit. I doubt that was the summary on the story pitch document, but you get the picture. It was far less hateful a cast, even if it did revisit the definition of insanity bad guy, and I was far more a fan of it than in the third game. 
And that map, because I promised to mention it, was definitely a thing that existed. And that's all I have to say about it. Oh, alright, maybe a bit more. It was a big map, it was a seriously pretty part of the made-up world, and it was an environment that, just like before, screamed out to be explored and mucked about in. Thankfully, Far Cry 4 remained just as much fun as before to do that mucking about, even if it was an almost carbon copy of what came before. Design by committee does take away from the overall experience, and Far Cry 4 suffered from that feeling. It, it was rote, it felt like Far Cry 3, but by this point it also felt like Watch Dogs and Assassin's Creed and the crew and the Division eventually. But, and it's an important but, I cannot lie, Far Cry 4 was still riddled to its core with emergent elements that brought pure undiluted chunks of chunky fun. These random things in an open world are some of the best things in any game ever, so it's not surprising, but that doesn't take away from the achievement. I'll never forget seeing three rebels having a pitched gun battle with a lone eagle atop a ridge, all the people screaming in fear as it swooped down and attacked them one by one. And the eagle won. And that's without even going into the joy that was riding an elephant into battle, which ranks up there as ridiculous in the best kind of way, and something that, despite my instincts flaring up and telling me to remember Far Cry 4 in a slightly more negative light thanks to its over-familiarity, lifts my very soul. And back to the side projects. While Blood Dragon was one note in its presentation, Far Cry Primal took the spin-off thing to heart and crafted a whole new huge world. Well, one plastered on top of the Far Cry 4 map at least, and transported you back thousands of years to a world before decorative garden rocks, the concept of USB charging, or cling film. Primal was a proper self-contained expansion, released at a premium price and contained tons of new stuff to get caught up doing for way longer than you'd expect to. With an imaginative, rarely seen setting for a game, a huge campaign to play through, and a genuine feeling that a lot of effort had gone into this one, it was, well, it surprised me how boring I found Primal. Yes, I'm letting personal opinion infect this again, sue me. The prehistoric cry looked great, as you'd expect, sure, but the primitive nature of things with its lack of grey and innocence of wandering aimlessly through somewhere without roads made it that bit more alluring. And the mechanics of building up your tribe, welcoming in new members, improving your structures, watching people dance, I guess, was definitely a welcome addition. There was, once again, plenty to sink your life into. But crikey, the banality, the same againness, the formula. It was such a swerve from Far Cry 2, a game that looked like it would be the same as everything else but ended up being completely different, and brutalising you throughout did I mention it gave you malaria. Anyway, skipping from that to Primal, which looked like nothing else and as though it would be vastly different, but ended up being just the same as the last few Far Cries, taking it relatively easy on you and not even giving you the flu, which would probably kill you in prehistoric times. It was weird, to use a disgustingly lazy term. Don't get me wrong, riding a mammoth into battle somehow manages to be more fun than riding an elephant into battle even though it's literally the same thing barring a size difference and some ginger fur. And when you turn off all the HUD elements and just rely on your instincts and superpowers naturally, it proves both relaxing and exciting an experience in oddly equal measure. Devoid of context, there is a lot to like about Primal, but in context I have sympathy for those who saw it as a rather banal experience, like me. I saw it like that. I wrote a review professionally saying as much, and I said it already in this video. But crikey the banality. See? Regardless of how good the formula is, and despite how it's dressed up, it's still that same formula, and Far Cry Primal stuck very much to that homogenised formula. Fun, but bland. Beautiful, but not bold. Mammoth, but not, um, elephant? First, and most importantly, Far Cry 5 rejigged the crafting system so there's no way of crafting a wallet using still-beating unicorn hearts or whatever it was they were building to. While I wholly support the move away from this barbaric quest for fine walleteering, at the same time I do feel like the new game was missing something because of its change to crafting. I mean, sure, pipe bombs explode all nice and stuff, but it's not the same as harpooning a tapir so you can make some new shoelaces, is it? So Far Cry 5, the least political of the Far Cry games, what with it centering on a white supremacist cult in the modern US, definitely nothing inherently political about that setting, not where I'm sitting, and now I've made myself sad because some of you will actually think that. Anyway, it's the Far Cry set closest to home, Middle America, the dullest, safest place in the world where nothing could go wrong in one of the world's richest countries that isn't a little travelled island with 20 indigenous inhabitants, ripe for a fresh sack of freedom as delivered by a foreigner. 
Nope, this one was America, land of libertines, home of the few, land of the stave. And you got a dog. Little else about Far Cry 5 proved particularly memorable, not least the toothless narrative, which at times veers close to whataboutery and in the most part just painted the bad guys as caricatures of what cult leaders are in our minds. The landscapes were gorgeous, but banal. The action engaging, but incredibly similar to almost everything that's come before in this series. But yeah, you, you got a dog. I just... There's nothing to talk about outside the political debate surrounding the game, and an ending that's genuinely surprising, at least depending on your choice. No spoilers, obviously, but it's not enough to make Far Cry 5 anything special. They removed radio towers as a mechanic and added in fishing, which meant one of my favourite things about previous games was replaced with another thing I like from games. Balanced. And that about sums up the Far Cry series to me. Balanced. Individual elements can be phenomenally good fun, where others can be terrible, dull and boring. Or malarial. It's a series of vast promises that often underwhelm, but also a series of understated brilliance and genre-defying mechanics. It's a series that tackles heavy subjects in its stories, but never does more than scratch their surface. Or adds mutants in to pad it out a bit for your Crytek. It's a series with near-universal praise across the board, yet one that's very easy to find people with legitimate, understandable criticisms of it. It is, in short, confusing. And there you go. So that's most of the Far Cry's played by me, your hero, Bransfield, except for the Wii one I couldn't get working and the arcade one because I am not an arcade, but most of them. And what have we learned? Well, that my opinions on the Far Cry series are correct. It changed gaming and had a giant impact a couple of times, but generally speaking it's all just a bit empty and bland. I'm sure any negative comments about a beloved series will go down well with folks in the comments. Let's see. Thanks for watching. Again, if you want to subscribe, that'd be a huge help. A share can change a life, and throwing your support behind me on Patreon, link below, would make me do a backflip of joy were it not for the fact that I'd break my neck and die. I want to give thanks to these fine few who offer $5 or more in support each month. And a special kind of gratitude goes to the following who are my higher tier supporters. I'm not saying it makes them better people, they just are naturally better people. Video Brains or Jake Tucker. Takara Hoshi. Lola Osman. After a stressful house move, a bout of zero creativity, a sliced open toe, and a pitched battle against terrible internet in the new place, I'm glad to have got this video done and out there. Bye!